Today at the National Press Club, the Chief Executive of National Seniors Australia, Michael O'Neill. As head of the country's largest seniors organisation, Mr O'Neill reflects on the outlook ahead for Australians over the age of 50. From the National Press Club in Canberra, Michael O'Neill. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Press Club and today's National Australia Bank Address. We're very pleased to welcome here today Michael O'Neill from National Seniors Australia for the first time, which is a bit surprising given the uh, emphasis that there's been for some years now on the implications for public policy of having an ageing population in Australia, uh, affecting, and this is no help to uh, Michael O'Neill, but affecting so many portfolios. Uh, it affects thoughts in policy making about superannuation, pensions, population policy itself, tax, the retiring age, just to name a few of them. Um, but National Seniors Australia has uh, some seven, 270,000 uh, paid up members and uh, it represents the uh, whole sector and that spectrum of public policy issues about which he's going to talk to you today. Please welcome Michael O'Neill. Thank you, um, Ken Randall, Chairman of the, the National Press Club. Um, I acknowledge uh, Senator Foravanti Wells, um, members of the Press Gallery, um, other guests, ladies and gentlemen. And as American journalist Henry Louis Mencken and actor Bette Davis both said, old age is no place for sissies. Today I want to share with you some thoughts about ageing and an ageing population the challenges we face as a nation and as a community in dealing with both. Last week, National Seniors released a major piece of research on the outlook for aged care in this, in, in this country. I want to further ref reflect further on those findings and the outlook for aged care and broaden my remarks to some other key issues um, in the context of an ageing nation. My comments, my comments come, as Ken indicated, from the perspective of a membership group with 270,000 members across the country uh, aged 50 and over, a group that has operated for 34 years and is in fact the fourth largest over 50s group in the world. National Seniors has with this membership base and a dedicated research and policy arm a strong capacity to understand the issues of concern to the over 50s. So to put it in context, perhaps a reminder of a few key points about the changing demographics of this nation. They set the scene, scene somewhat for the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. And I'm sure you've heard some of them before. For example, the number of older people aged 65 to 84 is expected to double between now and 2050. And the number of over 85s is expected to quadruple in the same period. The proportion of working age people is expected to fall with only 2.7 people of working age to support each Australian aged over 65 compared to five today and 7.5 in 1970. And finally, in terms of statistics, currently more than 25% of the Australian government budget is dedicated to health, aged care and age-related pensions. That's expected to increase significantly with the shift in population. So what has society, commentators and indeed, gov indeed governments said about the change in demographics and what it means. The, the response is best described as a doomsday scenario, with the nation being overrun by oldies on motor scooters, terrorising the revenue of government through pensions and health costs. National Seniors acknowledges that there will be implications for government and for society. That's a reality. There will also be positives through opportunities associated with a different demographic. In other words, we, look, we need to both accept that there will be challenges, challenges, but appreciate that there will also be opportunities provided by a changing demographic. Our response to this reality will be influenced by a core issue of how we value or otherwise our oldest citizens. What importance do we now and in the future wish to attach to the way our elders live? It will be the values that will these values that will determine how we respond as a community to the challenges of an ageing population. 
We have in recent days, in fact, um, had reference to one of the major social issues that uh, we will need to inevitably deal with as a society involving euthanasia. This is an issue of great import to all Australians, but perhaps um, has a particular relevance to older Australians and the choices they may desire to make. It's an aspect of ageing connected inevitability to issues of care and health and support as we age. So how are our oldest and most vulnerable Australians included in society? Do we allow them to be socially isolated by putting them in housing on the fringes of cities away from transport and services? Do we resent the expenditure on health and medicines directed at their well-being rather than being dedicated to the education or the environment or infrastructure? Do we allow age pension reform to become the political football it was in 2008 to ensure people can live with dignity? It was noticeable in, notable in recent years when the emphasis and mantra of working families was endless. There was no effort to join the dots together and recognise that older Australians were the original working families. Older Australians were the ones who worked and lived in a different time without the extravagances of today, but who helped create the country and economy we enjoy today. Older Australians are also an integral part of working families today, whether as informal caregivers to children and grandchildren, or as providers of deposits for cars and houses for grandchildren. <laughs> I think we've got some uh, suitable donors in the audience. Without dwelling on statistics, um, it's interesting no to note that the cost to the economy of replacing older Australians who provide unpaid assistance to people with disability, it's just one area, but to people with disability, the cost would be $3.9 billion. So older Australians contribute enormously in a whole range of ways, and that's one example of the, the, uh, the investment that they make in the, in the economy. In the, current, in the context of the current political situation, the treatment of aged care in rural and regional Australia should be a consideration. A strong and healthy local community thrives on local interests and the richness of diverse age groups. Successful communities sustain and care for, their, uh, for all their, their members at whatever age. So providing for aged care locally should be as important a goal as the provision of broadband services or maintaining schools and courthouses and transport for rural communities. We need to decide as a community how much we value our elderly. If one considers the importance which some European and Asian cultures attach to their elders, it begs the question of where our oldest Australians are on our scale of importance. Indigenous Australians place a great import on the wisdom and knowledge of their elders. It begs the keepers of the culture of the first inhabitants of this land. How well does Australian society respect its older citizens? Do we have regard to making our towns and cities, our infrastructure age friendly? Or if we provide services and they're not suitable to older people, regard that as their, regarded as their problem, not society's? So against that background, I want to look initially at the issue of aged care. It's a challenge at the present time, but will become of increasing significance as population projections become the progressive reality over the decade ahead. As I said earlier, it will inevitably impact on the, be impacted on by the key social issues of choice and life. Some facts on aged care. It's too often assumed to be about aged care homes and putting folk there for the last few years of their lives. There is no single model for aged care. It's a system that has a range of options along a journey and care needs will change along that journey. It's a mix of care at home, people on their own or with a partner, sometimes with family members, usually a daughter, as well as aged care homes. Aged care homes, please, not facilities. Um, who wants to live in a facility? We have um, prison facilities, we have uh, detention centre facilities, we need to have aged care homes. It's high and low care. It's also changing with people's expectations, whether for themselves or for the family, and will change even further at the, with the influence of the baby boomers. It's provided by spouses, by sons and daughters, by family and friends who are informal care providers. Folk who give and give and who we too easily take for granted. 
Care, whether at a person's home or in an aged care home, is also delivered by a mix of community, charitable, church and not-for-profit groups. Over 85 per cent of people who will age in their own home, often with the help of home and community care programs. The preference for ageing in one's home is about a familiar environment, local neighbourhood, friends nearby, long-term GP and dentist nearby. National Seniors undertook some polling of members and non-members earlier this year to test the water on the key issues for the over 50s. 74 per cent of respondents rated aged care as extremely important and 14 per cent indicated that aged care would influence the way they voted. Aged care was the second most important issue after health in this survey work. During the last election, National Seniors conducted candidate forums in 13 marginal seats. Aged care was inevitably one of the issues that people raised. Too often it was about navigating through the complexities of the system, the availability of beds, respite or inconsistent delivery of hack services. The message from a consumer perspective is the need to ensure that care and associated activity is about quality of life. The focus on quality of care has been increasingly subsumed by the issue of service delivery as, delivered by the, as defined by those who provide the services and unfortunately by the funding providers and regulators, the government. It is essential that the balance is recovered and that quality of life is the core focus in delivery of care. One of the characteristics of the current system is inadequate recognition of the consumer and their interests. Too often it is about providers and the government determining direction with lip service to consumers. This is unfortunately a characteristic of the health system generally. And I acknowledge that consumer bodies like national seniors need to do more in this regard. Sustainability, sustainability is essential. And to be fair, the provider sector is confronted by a difficult challenge to deliver quality care in the framework of a financial model that is broken. National Seniors Engaged Access Economics, the leading economic consulting group, to undertake research into aspects of aged care and in particular to explore alternate f models for funding. We did so to encourage debate and in the language of today to seek a new paradigm. Access came back with three key messages. The current aged care system is not working well, with quality of care declining over the past decade. As demand is growing, access view is that tinkering with the system is not a solution. Secondly, significant investment in aged care is needed, particularly for new homes and in developing a skilled workforce to deliver aged care. Importantly, the current system is not sustainable without higher taxes being levied not an attractive policy option for anyone. And thirdly, new ways of financing aged care are essential. A survey of more than um, 3,200 seniors found that many people were prepared to pay for higher quality aged care whilst demanding that a safety net remained in place for those who could not afford to do so, which was encouraging. <coughs> 